Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, we're going to pick it up here in about verse 12 in a moment. Paul is talking here and he's concerning, hey, in establishing the church, we've had trouble. We've had good, we've had bad, but the church still continues on. And you should never let outside interference interfere with the operation of the ministry. It just shouldn't happen. Why? Because God is always with us. He's going to take care of that trouble. And there was at this time much trouble or had been in this church at Corinth. You pick that up in 1 Corinthians at Chloe's in a, along about the beginning of the book that she, she was the more or less the house in which the church was held at Corinth. And um, there was a lot of trouble there, incest in one case, and, and then a lot of people uh, misusing the very word itself and um, much trouble. But he said, out of all that, we still have a beautiful work here. And that's the way it always is. Don't ever let Satan gain the hand of God's ministry. That, that should not be. I, I can word that a little differently. If it's truly God's ministry, Satan is not going to gain the upper hand because we have it, own it, it's ours in our Father's name, and so be it. So he continues talking to them about the hard times and how much he loves them, that they've stayed with him. And we pick it up in chapter 6, verse 12, a word of wisdom from our Father, and verse 12 reads, uh, Ye are strayed, that's to say you're strained in us. In other words, this, uh, you are not strained in us. It means you, you are, you're not straining and you're no strain on our relationship. We can still handle it. But ye are strained, which is to say um, you are cramped in your own bowels. In other words, uh, you, your inward parts, you, you cramp yourself. You bring it on yourself by... When, when they allowed this to go on in the church, the incestuous affair and, and so forth, verse 13, Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, I mean, he, spiritual children, he founded that church, be ye also enlarged. In other words, return your love to us. We bring it to you through all the trials, tribulations, it has been no strain. We're not cramped about it. And you haven't certainly been a, a, a strain on our relationship. We love you. Return that love. Verse 14. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness. Well, there is none. Anytime you have light, it dispels darkness. Now, many people misunderstand this in as much as they think, well, we're not even supposed to go near sinners. That's not what it said. Don't yoke yourself to one. That means a fellow servant. You can't, a, a, an unbeliever is not going to serve God. And if you yoke yourself to them, they're going to be nothing but a drag. All they're going to be is pulling one way when you're going the other. In, in another place, Christ would say, put the yoke on, I am the yoke. Meaning if you, put, if you put just a plain strap around an animal's neck, an oxen or a horse or a mule, without a collar and hames, it'll cut them. And it, very painful. But if you put on a collar and the hames and the right, a yoke, then the work is easy. And so it is if you put Christ on, hard times are made a lot easier because you've got him with you. But what he's saying here is whatever you do, you put a yoke on to do work, okay, to pull a load. Don't ever, ever 
team up with an unbeliever or somebody that believes totally different than you do. That, that as far as your stability is concerned, they become an unbeliever because they don't believe what you believe. And you yoke yourself to them and you are asking for trouble like you've never known before. And certainly um, it will turn out exactly that way. But as far as going around the unbeliever and planting seeds, that's why we're here. So you cannot prohibit yourself from going around non-believers. That does not mean yoking. But to plant a seed of truth, that that truth can grow. But you must not um, fellowship in the ministry with them. Uh, as a, and bring them in as a part of the ministry until they're converted. Or um, you, will, you will reap uh, bad reports. Verse 15. And what concord or what agreement hath Christ with Belial? What, what agreement do you have with, with Christ and Satan? I mean, that's what you're trying to do if you unequally yoke yourself with a non-believer. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel. Um, in all their wisdom, they're still foolish. Okay. So you, you cannot bring them into any position of authority within the ministry, that is to say, to represent the ministry. Otherwise, you're going to get a bad name. Okay. You will have trouble. So therefore, never, ever yoke yourself with darkness when you're in the light. You stay in the light so that you can go to those that are still in darkness and plant a seed. Perhaps maybe convert one of them. Verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? There, there is no agreement. You don't want idols in the temple of God, or for ye are the temple, the many-membered body, of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And so it is in, in serving our Heavenly Father. And of course, when it says here, as, uh, as, the, as God hath said, uh, where did he say this at? Well, he said it in Exodus 29, 45. He said it in Leviticus 26, 12. He said it in Jeremiah 31, 33. We read that not long ago. And that's the way our Father is. If you walk with him rather than infidels, then certainly um, he will be your father and you will be his child. Verse 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not. That's don't attach yourself by yoke. Touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you. Now, th this is where it becomes very important. Many people might try to hang on too close to unbelievers, to infidels, to the prince of darkness, and then wonder why God doesn't bless them. He won't have it. He will not put up with it. He gives that simple advice. Do not yoke yourself to a non-believer. Do not yoke yourself to somebody that is a drag. To, to the ministry. It is well to be received by God and then you can go there and plant seeds, but don't tie your, don't attach yourself to them. Um, and there you have it. That, that makes it pretty plain. Verse 18. And will be a father unto you and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. That is God's promise that if you do as he says, if you take his advice and follow his will, he's going to be with you. And I'm going to tell you something. When you have God with you, you can do whatever it is he would have you do. It becomes real easy because you have the yoke on that is for sure the yoke of Christ. And it is an enabler to assist you in whatever you're doing. You will never receive better advice than that directly from your father. And if you want a home study all by yourself, you, you take those um, chapters and verses that I said in relation to that as God has spoken, Exodus 29, 45, 
Leviticus 26, 12, and Jeremiah 31, 32, 33, rather. You'll, you'll remember in Jeremiah 33, 29, that is in that same chapter is where he said, the sin of a child will never fall on the father's shoulders or vice versa. The sins of a father will never fall on the child. And, and so it is. Why? Because God, God is the executor of his estate. And his estate is that many-membered body. We have him with us. He is our father. He is our God. And we are his people. We are his sons and we are his daughters. And uh, within that, he blesses both sons and he blesses both daughters, as that particular verse so declares. Chapter 7, verse 1, it continues. <clears throat> Having therefore these promises, it's a promise of God. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's, let's do what God would have us to do. Let's throw out anything that is unnatural. <clears throat> and... and hang on to the promises of God. Well, what's the promises of God? That if you'll not yoke yourself to unbelievers, he will be your father and you'll be his child. That's a, that is a absolute promise. And if you claim that promise and if you remind the father of that promise, he will execute the results thereof. <clears throat> and it is all goodness. Um, it certainly is. Why? Because our father loves us. Verse 2. Receive us, we have wronged no man. Now, this is to say, op open your hearts to us. Open your minds to us. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. You, you won't find one case of where a true ministry of Christ has defrauded anyone. They run a clean operation because it's God's house. Um, and what he's saying is, you can open your minds and receive the word of God for Christ is in that ministry and it is Christ's word that is taught by that ministry and you can certainly always um, uh, be a part of that. Uh, they've cheated no one, they defrauded no one and God's word will never cheat someone. God's word will never defraud someone. If it is taught with understanding chapter by chapter, verse by verse, whereby it is God's word and his truths that come forth. Verse 3. I speak not this to condemn you. Um, there's, there's no reflection on you because of what I'm saying. For I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. You, you. you will be in my heart and I will love you till the day I die is what Paul is saying here in the Greek tongue. And, and he couldn't put it any plainer that he, he loved the family he had created there. I mean, they, they were infidels. He comes there and teaches the word of God and they are changed. I mean, a total change in people. They're really something. They're children of the living God and he is their father. Verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying in you. That glorying is, is the fact that he was so very pleased with them. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. In spite of all these hardships, in spite of all the tribulation, oh, it is worth it when just one is converted and, and, and when we yoked with Christ can go out into the, the infidels and plant seeds and convert more. Verse 5. For when we came, when, for when we were come into Macedonia, uh, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings and within were fears. I mean, there, there was trouble all the way around, and, and uh, so it was. Verse 6, what? Nevertheless, besides that, God that comforteth those that are cast down comforted us by the coming of Titus. Boy, he came, he perked us up, he gave us the good news of what was happening there with you all, and it just really made our day. Now, I, I do want to tell you, the last time we had this phrase, casting down, it was katabo. It's not that case here. 
casting down here is tapenas, uh, a different Greek word, and it simply means to, to be exactly that, put down. Um, but how, how great it was that Titus, along with a partner, had really brought some good news, and you'll find out who that partner most likely is. It was Luke, of course, Luke traveling with him. Verse 7, And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. I mean, when, when I found out you had straightened the church out, because Paul had written them a letter and said, hey, I'm coming and I'm, I'm going to pass you this time because I would come with a big stick. I, I, you can work your own problems out, both the incestuous affair and other problems. Uh, remember the problem he had um, in the first book where he said, don't, don't beat him to death. As a Christian, you got to forgive. Let him, uh, the, once he converts, do forgive him. Well, apparently they had. And they, he had received this good news from Titus, and oh, it, um, he um, enjoyed that visit. Verse 8, For though I made you sorry with a letter, I, I was hard on you. That's tough love. That's good. I do not repent. Though I did repent, for I perceive that the same epistle hath made you sorry, though it, though it were but for a season. In other words, just a little while. Tough love is that way. Tough love is real love. Uh, Paul wrote them that letter, and, and he's, he let them know, you do not want to see me if this is still going on when I get there. Because he would take care of business, big time. And... It is a wonderful thing when he sees his own students, his own children, spiritually speaking, that have repaired this trouble through his advice, which is the advice from Almighty God, and has straightened out the situation whereby it is complete, it is well, and um, with him. Verse 9. Now, I rejoice... Not that we were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. In other words, you, I rejoice because you repented and straightened it out yourself. Again, I will repeat, when, when his students took care of this at his advice, the tough love, he said in that letter, it got it done. Verse 10, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, listen to that, to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. In other words, the, the sorrow of repenting unto truth brings eternal life. But when you turn, if, if you sorrow and go with the way of the world, it is death. It's death eternal. So you have the choice of life eternal or death eternal. Beloved, that's how serious this is when you have much trouble in a church. It is a sad situation. You, you are to bring eternal life, not death. And eternal life it was, how precious it was for Titus to bring that good news. Verse 11, For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a god godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, Yea, what vehement desire, you really worked at it. Um, yea, what zeal, you were so zealous in it. Uh, yea, what revenge uh, to, to remove it from your midst. In all things you have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. You took care of business. This is, this is the results of tough love. 
And it, it never, you know, many people become enablers when they should be practicing tough love. If you really love somebody, then they're, they're worth dishing out a little tough love whereby that understanding can come to the forefront and people can live in peace. Verse 12, wherefore, <clears throat> though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. I, I wanted you, you were, <clears throat> excuse me, you were letting this go on right in the middle of church. You didn't put a stop to it. I, I wanted it stopped. <clears throat> and I, I wrote the letter being difficult not only to the wrongdoer or the, even the one that was being injured, but to get the church in gear, to get it done, to get it taken care of. Verse, verse 13, Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. It's good news. Yes, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we, we for the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. You, you really, to hear the good news and everything when Titus was there, Titus probably had a little thing to do with it also. Uh, he was comforted by that. They got it done. Verse 14, For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting which I made before Titus is found a truth because it was the truth. Again, tough love will bring this. It is very difficult for people to practice tough love. There's, there's a reason for that. The one that must execute the tough love, it hurts them as well as it does the person that it's exercised upon. It's painful, but the joy it brings with success and the touch of God and the helping of a human life and soul is so precious. It's something to really rejoice about, something to really be thankful about. And this is why when you rip off any yoke, uh, connection, attachment to any uh, infidel and practice the Word of God in truth and deed, how comforting and what a comfort you receive from the living God in the ministry. Verse 15, And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, that is to say, Titus, whilst uh, he remembered the, the obedience of you all, that you did it, how with fear and trembling you received him. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that Titus, uh, you know, he was pretty direct. He's got one of the shortest little old books in the Bible, but it's all business. He was straight on, and I'm sure that they took that quite well from this report. 16, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. How precious it is. What a compliment to someone that was so troubled. And little old Titus, along with someone else, and most likely Luke, I mean, he whipped them into shape with the tough love Paul had sent. And um, I'm sure Titus, I can imagine some of the things he said, hey, you do not want Paul on your neck down here if you don't take care of business. You know better, you better get it done. And they started cleaning house. And, and they got it done. Uh, and so it was. And, and with that, Paul said, I'm, I'm totally happy. Why? That's Christianity. That's the way the Christian ministry operates. That's the way Christ operates. Chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, besides that, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. That grace is unmerited favor. That God loves you when you cooperate with Him and follow Him. I, I've just got to tell you that's what Paul is saying. Verse 2. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty 
abounded unto the riches of their liberality, uh, their generosity. Okay, this is one thing Paul always was a little awkward with. He's, the boys downtown wanted him to raise money for them. Uh, Paul never took a salary and he never uh, did raise money for himself. He was a tent maker and worked at it. But the boys downtown would have him put together the money bag and that's kind of what he's leading up to. You're very generous in verse 3. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. So they, they were, he, he's not pushing them. He's not begging. So it's got to be your will to do this. You gotta be, it's got to be your will to be generous. Verse 4, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, to the boys downtown. You know, he was always loyal to the boys downtown in Jerusalem, but they weren't, they weren't all that good to him. Any, any way you want to slice it, they, they still kind of like to play uptown stuff. Okay. When Paul came to town, they were some of them were even ashamed to be seen with him, eating with him, because why? He helped Gentiles. So um, it, um, it, uh, it rackles, it, it makes me a little uncomfortable that Paul was put in this position for the boys downtown. They seemingly did not appreciate it in the way that they should have. By that I mean appreciating Paul for the fact that it was away from them and on the road to Damascus that Christ himself struck him down, Paul, and brought him into the ministry. And uh, this seemed to be a little awkward at times. Peter accepted it and then when the big boys showed up from downtown, he kind of drifted away from Cornelius' family, the Gentiles, and Paul. Well, he knew it was of God, but that's the boys downtown, and, and enough said, maybe too much, five. And this they did, not as we hope, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. That, that, that was beautiful. Not, I, I mean, just giving themselves into the service of the living God, sex, in so much that we desired Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you <clears throat> the same grace also. That same love and that same unmerited favor that uh, it would be done there in, in your uh, place. Seven, therefore, <clears throat> excuse me, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge and in all diligence, and in your love to us, that ye abound in this grace also, that you love the Father and you enjoy the unmerited favor and participate therein, as part of the many-membered body, of course. He said, he did, again, I, I want to reemphasize, he, he was not using terms here of force. It was by will. For you have to be a willing person, participant, or you're, you're um, wasting your time. Nobody can force you into the ministry. That's fraud. You have to go on your own, your own decision, your own life. Verse eight, I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others and to prove the sincerity of your love. <clears throat> Paul was always real good. If what he's saying here, God didn't tell me to give this advice. I'm giving you this advice on my own um, accord here. This is not from God. Paul was always real good about that and letting people know. Verse 9, For we know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know his unmerited favor. That though, through his, though, yet though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that ye through his poverty might be rich, might be rich in truth and in word and in deed, in knowing that God was with them. And here comes the advice, verse 10. And herein I give my advice. 
For this is expedient for you, who hath begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. In other words, it was your will a year ago to get this done. 11. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness uh, to will, and again, by will, not, not force, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. Uh, he said, this is my advice. Uh, just, he's not being forceful. He's not begging. That's the, God never sends out beggars. Always remember that. 12. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. In other words, if you don't have anything, you can't give anything. <clears throat> we have many people that are on fixed incomes and they can't afford their medicine and their food. They got nothing. And if, if, if for the sake of God, if they want to give a little love offering, but don't try to tithe and go hungry or go without medicine that you need to maintain yourself as a servant of God. You have to be willing even then, okay? But what Paul is saying here is, is some of you can, some of you can't, period. That's it. Don't feel guilty, 13. For I mean not that other men be eased uh, and ye burdened. There, there's, uh, you, you don't want an extra expense or something you can't afford. Don't overload your donkey. Keep things in, in, in perspective, 14. But by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that's the boys downtown, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. In other words, it should equal out. <clears throat> and 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 um, this this is of God's word. It was Paul's idea. It wasn't from God, but it's good advice, and it's advice well worth taking. So don't ever let anyone write you a letter and tell you you must borrow money to be blessed of God. You can't buy blessings from God. They're lying to you when they do that, and they're begging. It's God's will that there be an equality if, well, what does that mean? If you haven't got it, you haven't got it. That's not that difficult, is it? So we'll pick this up in the next lecture. Uh, our Father is always so loving. When you follow Him, He will be your Father. And you'll be His child. It's a good way to be. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the mark of the beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good. From Puerto Rico throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, it's all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We're not going to judge people. Our Father is the judge. You leave the judging to him. You have the right to spiritually discern. And when you do spiritually discern, so it is. It's a gift from God. <clears throat> now, uh, those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you, as always. 
You got a prayer request, you don't need the number, you don't need an address, why? God knows what you're thinking. He, you don't even have to say it out loud because he loves you. You're his child. Let him know that you love in return. Return it to him, that's very important. Let it be your will to want to return it to him. That makes a big difference. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. Leah from Texas. My question, Romans 9, verse 20. It was, it was as you say, we are born, if it is as you say, we were born in a place uh, and to the family that we deserve, how can it be that God, knowing what will happen, will send a child to people who abuse and kill children, or does this refer to God's elect only? No, no, it, God is not that, he, he uh, gives us a set of laws we're supposed to go by. If someone abuses a child, they're supposed to be corrected for it. If somebody kills a child, they're supposed to be killed publicly. And do you know what God says about that in Deuteronomy 19 and Numbers 35? He said, hey, the rest of the crooks will see that when you do it publicly. Let the father cast the first stone or throw the switch or drop the pill, but kill him. Send him up here to me. Others will see and these things will cease happening among you. But we don't do that. If anything, we, we, we uh, mourn the child, but we baby the killer. I mean, well, he needs, to re he needs a, a, a little rehearing, and he needs this, and this, count, this state says, we're going to do away with the death penalty. That's, that's anti-God. Our Father demands. You see, man can set up all the courts he wants to. He can appoint all the judges he wants to. But there's still a trial coming for someone that murders a child, and it's up there. The child is up there, and God is up there. And he's waiting to get his hands on that critter. Okay, And it's going to happen. You cannot con God. But that, that's why. It's not God's fault. It's man's fault that we do not enforce God's law in our nation and be blessed. And fortunately, in old times, it certainly happened. Charlene from Louisiana. Charlene, I know that abused by father and un uncle and brother. It's not your fault. You have every right to study the God of, Word of God with us, to be blessed by it, and God points you as innocent. So you just put all that aside and love our Heavenly Father and follow Him, and you're a good sister, we're happy to have you with us. God is happy to call you daughter. So you, um, you, you just believe and stand fast. Bill, it's not your fault. Bill from Ohio. If two of every flesh was on Noah's Ark, black, white, Chinese, Japanese, and so forth, what, what would, why wouldn't it say in why would it say in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20, only eight souls were saved by water on Noah's Ark? Eight, only eight Adamic souls. The Word of God pulls forth the family through which Christ would come. Okay, that's, that's, what, is, that's what the genealogies of God's Word consist of. And it is not that God is not interested in all the Gentiles, the other races. He created them on the sixth day. He looked and it was good. He's happy with them. But it was so that salvation could come for all people, all races, all colors, all creeds. That Adamic race had to come forward through which Mary would conceive and the Christ child would come, and salvation would be made, made available for everyone. Joseph from uh, California, from North Carolina, uh, finally at age 59, by your teaching, I've started to understand the Word of God. Old Marines can learn. Well, they sure can. They're disciplined. That's what it takes. Question, will the Antichrist be in flesh body 
as he will be when he is returned to earth, I would like to make his five months here as unpleasant as I can. Well, you let the Holy Spirit take care of that. That's coming from an, an old Marine and that's understandable. Uh, it's good to have you with us, Semper Fi. Uh, from Florida, we got Monty. I do not know if anyone ever asked this before, but when God created the heavens and the earth in seven days, was that in our days, 24 hours, or in his days, 1,000 years? I am asking because if time and space and all creation had not existed until he made it, would not the only measure of time have been his own? Uh, please answer. Well, you, you know, science itself or the artifacts that we find document that it was approximately 7,000 years to rejuvenate this earth, not to create it from the beginning because it was created a long time before that millions of years. But in this earth age, we know that since the catabo that ended the first earth age, we find dino mammoth frozen in the tundra in both Alaska and in Russia. And the carbon dating is about 14,000 years ago. That seven days with God and 6,000 years for us since that time uh, brings us to 2012. Dan from Florida, if we are to return to our spiritual bodies, where are they now? They're, they're right in here. Your spiritual body dwells within your flesh body. And as it is written in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse uh, 6 and 7, instantly when you die, the clay pot breaks, your spirit, which is the intellect of your soul and your being, your spiritual body, returns to the Father from whence it came. In other words, it came from the Father, it goes back to the Father. Uh, A from California, do you think that at the thousand year reign, millennium that is, that we, that our overcomers could possibly teach and preach at the same place and location where we live? Well, it's certainly possible. We know certainly that God's elect will teach. That's documented. That's part of God's word. You can read it yourself in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, where it stipulates that the overcomers, basically, uh, will teach with Christ as priest for a thousand years. So uh, that discipline comes forth, and discipline will be taught there. But bear in mind, during that teaching, it's going to be great because everyone will be in spiritual bodies. There will be no hang-ups in the flesh. In the flesh, we all have our little hang-ups. Uh, the flesh is very demanding, and we have that to contend with. But in the millennium, you will not have that to contend with. It will be much easier to reach people because they will be able to see Christ and to know He's real and so forth. Uh, Kathy from Ohio, I've always wondered about Ecclesiastes chapter 10, verse 20, where it says a bird of the air shall carry the voice. Isn't it ironic that we now have Tweeter and if, um, if, and if its very symbol is that of a bird? Do you see any correlation here? Uh, thank you so much for your teaching. You are so welcome. Well, it is right, especially in as much as the statement that the little bird can carry the story is don't ever tell anything because walls have ears. In other words, it, the word's going to get around. That's, that's what Ecclesiastes uh, is talking about is, is walls have ears, people have ears, and the little bird will carry it. And sure enough, a little tweet here and a little tweet there. And a lot of people have got in big trouble because it carries electronically to a lot of places. Uh, interesting, what? Uh, Travis from Minnesota, I'm 10 years old. Thank you for doing what you do. Well, you are so welcome. I want to tell you about the time God worked through you. Well, I was watching your show program and I told God, if you want me to write a letter to this channel and tell Pastor Arnold Murray to point his finger at, have Pastor Murray point his finger at me for two seconds 
and a little bit after you you did, and I, I, then I would like to ask what should I do to become more like Jesus. So I did point my finger. I kind of do that sometimes, don't I? Well, to be more like Jesus, you simply do what you're doing. You keep studying the Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I'm real proud of you that you are seeking God's will and, um, and, and are trying to follow Him. His Word is the way. That's the way He talks to us, okay? Uh, Herman from North Carolina, my question is, if God is all-seeing, knowing whom, why did he let the devil in the garden? Well, well because it's, that's the whole purpose. He destroyed the first earth age because a third of his children followed Satan. Revelation chapter 12, verse 1 through 4, documenting. Uh, he didn't want to kill his children. So instead, he destroyed that earth age. And he created this or brought in this earth age as a proving ground whereby each child is born innocent of woman to make his or her mind up whether they're going to follow the devil or Christ or God. Now, naturally, um, if he had destroyed the devil, there would be no negative influence and they wouldn't be tested. God will not have anything that isn't tested to prove true love because true love can only come forth from within each entity. You can't order it. You can't demand it. You can't buy it. It's not true. So true love comes from within each person. And that's why he wanted Satan to test them, whether they would remember God or go with him. He wants to know because he's calling out those that will, and they're not going to be in eternity. That's what this is all about. That's why he didn't. He is, um, there is one thing he does not know, and that's whether with free will you will love him or Satan. That's what he wants to know. Pam from Arizona. What does the Bible say about si singing songs or listening to music? Do they need to come only from the Psalms? No. You, you know, music is part of our culture. But it's like everything else. It's like any lecture or any sermon or any visitation or whatever. It's whatever the subject matter carries or documents. That's what's important. If a song belittles women, if a song uh, curses men, it's wrong. Okay. So uh, good men and good women, I should say. Uh, and, and certainly... Uh, it's, it's the message that is delivered that always counts, whether it's song, lecture, or whatever. If it's a, a, a pleasure to God, it's a pleasure to man. Marie from, Maria from West Virginia. Is it a sin to try to stop trouble between your family? No, it, it's not a sin, and it is kind of human nature. But sometimes uh, within family, you, family must work family troubles out sometimes. But, uh, you know, this is something as a Christian, God always gives us um, unction to do His will. And if He leads you to interfere, that's not a sin. It's just simply human nature. And God created us as we are. And that human nature was placed there by God, and if, it, if, if, if you feel led to intercede, or if there is a way you can intercede that will help, then certainly, most likely, it will be of God, and it is certainly not a sin. Um, if um, there, there are limits to that, if, if a family is doing something, and let's say you were to to cause hurt or harm, then I would think about that a great deal. Jacob from Mississippi, what did you mean when you said God was jealous? Well, he is. He's a jealous God. Uh, the, the Song of Moses, which is the song, according to Revelation 15, that those that overcome the mark of the beast, Satan, and are on their way to heaven are singing the Song of Moses, which very definitely lets us know that our God is a jealous God. Uh, he's our Father, 
And naturally, if he sees you worshiping an idol or, or the devil or somebody else, he loves you. And it's, it's simply nature, and he's super nature, that he is jealous if you begin loving Satan and the ways of the world instead of him. Anita from, um, from Annette from California. Are there any female angels? Well, all females are angels. They truly are. Um, and God only picked the very best of souls, the toughest of souls, to place in a female because the way some men would have come down on females, that is to say, even in teaching scripture, in ignorance they say a woman should stay in her place and they don't put it very high. Well, God places it pretty high, okay? He, he had four virgin daughters of Philip. They were all prophetess. They did what some men couldn't do up and down the West Bank and, or, or, or rather the Gaza Strip and up north from there. And uh, so they got it done. Or they, you might say the very University of God. Who, who was the head professor in teaching Bible and God's law? It was Hulda, the woman. Who was the judge when all of Israel was afraid to attack the enemy that was a, a female judge that had to lead the charge against the enemy? They wouldn't go if she wasn't in that front chariot. And she went. That was Deborah. So, um, so naturally, um, and, and women have childbearing. And, you know, I'm going to tell you something. We men are, are proud fathers and glad to be fathers, but when it comes to childbirth, that's scary, okay? That's real scary, but uh, so therefore God did bless certain peoples and he caused them to be females. They're all a bunch of angels. Um, naturally, there's exceptions to every rule, but that's mine. Okay, Jane from Georgia. My son passed away from a drug overdose, and I need to know if he is in heaven or hell. Thank you. He was bipolar. Um, he's in paradise. Okay. Read, uh, uh, Jane, I want you to read Luke chapter 16, the parable concerning Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man was no good, but he still ended up in paradise, but on the wrong side. Now, our father is very fair. He wants everything to be equal. And when somebody has a chemical imbalance, which is uh, bipolar, then that's innocency. So um, it is not our right to judge. It's not your right to judge or mine. But we can know from God's word that he is in paradise. And as a pastor with many years of teaching and studying God's word, I know that when there is a chemical imbalance that handicaps one, they're classified as innocent. Joe from Minnesota, where in the Bible does it state the Ten Commandments? You will find the Ten Commandments written in Exodus chapter 20. I'll repeat it again, Exodus chapter 20. Uh, there, there is one, in when you read the Ten Commandments, there is one that will say, Sin will stave ten generations for those that uh, hate God. Well, think about that statement. A lot of people then say, well, if a father sins, it can fall off on the child. That's not what it said. It said even if ten generations, if they hate God, that means in individually all ten generations hated God, well, naturally, they're not in good standing. But if any one of those generations loved God, that wouldn't that that would give him a pass out of that family, okay? So that that throws a lot of people. So I say that in passing. Greg from Florida, when you die, if you go to the bad side of the Gulf, do you have another chance of re at redemption, or are you committed to the lake of fire? The great white throne judgment doesn't take place until the end of the millennium, the thousand year period. You know, there are many, and we're not to judge. And you put us, the question puts us in a, a place of judgment. We know that our Father 
when um, the reason he has the thousand year period of teaching and Christ is still there as Yeshua, which means savior. So naturally there's gonna be teaching during that millennium and people saved or the savior would not be there. You would have Yahweh, the Godhead. So therefore, there will be teaching during that thousand year period. And, and a lot of people, how, how many people today are really taught in their house of worship that the Antichrist comes at the sixth trump and he's going to deceive a lot of people? Or how many are just taught, you don't have to study God's word, you're gonna fly away. And they, they will buy that. They don't read God's word to know they're being lied to. And, and therefore, they'll worship Satan when he comes as Antichrist. God is not going to judge someone like that to death because they didn't have a chance. Didn't have a prayer of a chance. They believed soothsayers. And I'm not judging anyone. I'm just saying that's the way it bounces, all right? And I'm just winning friends and influencing people here. But... Uh, that's the way it goes, and our Father's right there, and I'm out of time. Maybe that's a good thing. So we thank our Father for His Word. With the, and, and, you know, I love you because you enjoy studying God's Word, but most of all, what's really important, God loves you for it. Makes His day. When you take His Scripture, the letter He's written to you, and take it to heart, and let it change your life. It makes his day, and boy, when you make his day, is he going to make yours? You can count on it. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always, I do mean always, bless you. Most important, though, I want you to listen to me, and you listen good. You stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.